Welcome to Lab Results. We are live Wednesday, the 1st of September. Man, this COVID, COVID year is going by like nobody's business. All Every day becomes just one big day. Uh, but we are excited to be here tonight. We have a great conversation that we're going to have. I have two of my brothers, two of my fellow Black Man Lab board members that are actually going to be on tonight uh, to be uh, panelists this evening provide some great insight uh, because they themselves have um, done some great things and, and have helped some other young folks get to great things. So I felt it was really appropriate to have them on this evening. So, um, but before we get started, I wanna make sure that we do what we always do, which is bring our ancestors into this space. Um, what we do here on Lab Results is a really simple uh, shout out to our ancestors and really simple libation and pulling them into the space, which is us brothers here, simply thinking of somebody that may have motivated us today. And I'm gonna ask you all that out there that if you are listening in, somebody in your history, somebody in your past um, that really helped you to get to where you are today, think about them and hold them in your heart. And we're gonna do the same right now and just put a, our, our right fist in the air and just say that person's name. So on three brothers, if you could with me, one, two, three, Karita Williams. Mama Flora. I shared. So without further ado, because we only have an hour here on lab results, we want to make sure that we dive into the conversation. And we want to make sure that we are getting into the meat of what got these brothers to where they are today, but then also the different gems that they can drop for those that are listening out there. First and foremost, I want to introduce both of these gentlemen. And first, I'm going to introduce my brother, Fred Parham. Fred. Yeah, brother. How y'all doing tonight? How's everybody? And awesome. Lab Results. I'm blessed to be here for the very first time. It's my first time on Lab Results. And now, so now I'll, say, I'll say this, Fred. You, you were really instrumental when we were doing our Black Man Lab Live uh, on virtual. So we're glad to have you here finally, brother. So thank you. Uh, my other partner in crime, uh, Jared, what's happening? You're on mute, Jared. I'm sorry. Uh, what's going on there, Marty? What's going on, everyone? Uh, thank you for having me, brother. It's my first time as well. So I'm happy to be here. Man, glad to have you. Glad to have you. We so before we get started, go what you say, Fred? I said we need some first time bills and whistles. <laughs> I know. We, but also with us tonight, behind the scenes, is our uh, super engineer, producer extraordinaire, uh, Mark Lawson, who is behind the scenes. I'm surprised he didn't come up with a, burr, 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 burr. you know, y'all were introduced, man. But uh, I'm, I'm sure Mark will come up with something next time. So before we get started, guys, I want you, this is what we want to do. I just want to find out and give a little bit about you all's history. You know, what got you to where you are today? As far back as when you were, were kids, right? And where you grew up, the homes you grew up in, and what that looked like. Um, and what what kind of moved you in the direction to get to where you are today. And uh, Fred, if you could start, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, thanks so much, Marty. And I know that uh, we're pressed for time, so I'll be brief. Uh, and just keep mind to like three milestones uh, or decisions that I made, which were pivotal in my life's path. Uh, and I'll start one with listening to my mom and dad who I grew up with, <laughs> right? And right. so I'm not saying that to be funny to the listeners or viewers, but especially to the youth on, on, on uh, man, it starts there. You know, you can't be a leader at all of, about anything if you don't listen first. Uh, and so that's one. And then, man, in high school, you know, I was a pretty good athlete, you know, and I had four siblings and three older than me, two of whom were, were newspaper making, headline making athletes in San Antonio, my older brother in football, my sister in track and field. And so uh, I went to the military, which is my second milestone. And um, the summer of my junior year, I joined the Army Reserves, kind of following my brother and having, uh, you know, made some poor decisions in terms of my basketball playing time on varsity. Uh, and then thirdly, uh, really just deciding to 
go to graduate school here in Atlanta. At the time, it was 1996, and I'll talk more about that year, um, you know, in, in that time and why Atlanta was such a big draw for me and so many other millions of folks who live here. And before we move over to Brother Jared, so Fred, you, you were an athlete in high school. Yeah, basketball. Who, who, okay. I, now see, I knew Brother Jared who, I never knew that you were too, man. Look yeah. at that, okay. We, we, we almost got five, right? That's, yeah, we, that's, we have we five. We, yeah, we don't yeah. go to tell before. <laughs> we, we, we had we had to beat the young sons there, Marty. So Fred yeah. was out there. Fred, Fred was out there making sure we won. I'm mad. I'm mad. I missed that. You know, I'm mad. I missed that back when. But yeah, uh, and, and got I, video footage. I think Kobe's got the video. If they didn't destroy it, um, <laughs> he might have got rid of that. Eldridge has the video. El Eldridge has it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we're gonna have to check that out. And uh, we know that. We'll just let that be where it is now, and we won't go back to that. <laughs> we won't try to relive that because that might not go so well now. Um, so thanks so much, Fred. We'll dive deeper as well, man. Brother Jared, how about you? I know you grew up in, in, a, in a little town not too far from, from where I grew up at, but go That's ahead. Right. That's right. Yeah, so I, I grew up in uh, Racine, Wisconsin in the Midwest, and um, my family, although they're from the South, they migrated North um, following my mother. Mm -hmm. And um, I have a close knit, um, large family like many. Um, and as well as uh, I grew up in a community in Racine on the South side of Racine, um, all black community, working class community. And you know, a, a lot of times you don't realize what you missed until it's no longer there. And so I could really say I grew up in a community. And, um, and so um, Southside Racing, I love basketball, play basketball two, three times a day, you know, looking for whether it's the alley, the monkey bars or, uh, uh, or, or the basketball court at the school. But Southside Center was, you know, uh, was our ritual place where we played ball every day except for Friday evenings which I still don't understand why that's the case but that that was always the, the place um, we played um, my mother was instrumental in our community with doing bringing a lot of programs and you know writing a lot of grants for the community so I think I somewhat followed her footsteps in um, just doing community work so it's just a natural thing and I think that's what we all share as a brotherhood just, you know, we naturally will do um, things as a brotherhood for our community, um, you know, without pay, you know. And right. so, um, <laughs> so, uh, so I always was a part of doing some type of black male initiative for young black men, talking to young black men, talking to middle school students as a high school student. Mm -hmm. And um, there was a brother from Morehouse that inspired me you know, while I was a sophomore in, um, in high school. And he inspired me because this brother was, you know, you know, sharp, strong, um, suited and booted. Um, and the strength of how he spoke and his ability to articulate and his intelligence, it made me say, that's who I want to be. Because I wasn't, <laughs> I was, I was a little wayward and I just wasn't interested in school as much. Mm -hmm. I did what I needed to do to play hoop. Um, but that inspirational talk um, made me go a little hard, more hard in the paint when it came to education. And um, I went to Wilberforce undergrad. Uh, I went to Clark Atlanta um, in 91 for uh, graduate school in um, Department of Political Science. And even right now, I'm, I'm finishing up my PhD at Clark Atlanta University, I'm writing my dissertation now um, in political science. And I'm a pr professor at Clark Atlanta University in political science. So um, I've been an educator my entire career. I'm a second generation educator. And, um, 
And so I didn't re-meet my father until I was in my 20s. So from about four years old till in my 20s is when mm. I was reacquainted um, with that relationship. And so uh, let, me, let me jump in real quick. How did that happen? What was the occurrence of that? It, it's, it's, it's deep, brother, because my uncle um, was the chief of Atlanta Fire Department. He was in the newspaper. One of my cousins from South Carolina, that's where my the Grant family is from, saw him in the newspaper. She got in touch with him. And her first thing was, where's Jared? Mm -hmm. And um, my wife at the time and I were already going to the Bella Festival in Beaufort, South Carolina. That's where my, that my family's from, my father's paternal side. And um, I met my family there. I didn't meet my father on that trip. I came back for an, uh, another trip. And it was kind of like, what's the movie with Antoine Fisher with everybody around the table, mm -hmm. you know, and um, just waiting for that particular moment. And my father was the patriarch of the family because my grandfather, his father died when I was probably about two or three. Mm -hmm. uh, so he's the eldest of a, a black woman who had about 19 children. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, so grand family is large, but extremely large, double the size of my uncles and aunts on, on, my, on my maternal side. So my father was into politics and my mother was into education. So just think I'm a, I'm an educator who teaches politics. So some, somewhere yeah, hell it up. influenced me, you know? Yeah. Those, those genes don't lie, do they? Yeah, they, they, don't. they, they don't. They don't. They don't lie. Wow. And so now, hey, when you met him, you all maintained sense? Or? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We we just were kindred spirits, of course. Kindred, uh, uh, I, you know, being a coincidental word. But, um, yeah, we, we, were, we became very close very quickly uh, until his death. And oh. uh, so I was reacquainted with him when I was about 25, 26. And he passed away 2013. Mm. That's, that's, that's beautiful though, that you're able to have that relationship still, man. So, so often that doesn't happen. Yeah. Um, and, and, it, and you have reconciliation. So those things always just interest me. You know, I, I've been fortunate that, you know, my dad just turned 86 and you know, he's always been in my life, you know, and it's all I've ever known. So. Right. Um, that's 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 beautiful though, man. There's always a, a different path, right? Different path for us to get to where we're really supposed to be. Um, you said something else too that was stuck with me too. You talked about trying to hoop anywhere you could, and, oh, you know, on the playground, through the jungle gym, and all that. I, it made me think about what's everybody doing right now. That right. crate challenge that you know, up here, everybody's yeah, doing. Right, right, right. We used to take the crate and nail it to the. To that's the right. pole, you know, that's right. that was a hoop. Right. <laughs> so, different times, brother, different right. times. So, man, listen, um, Jerry, you were there on Monday uh, and, and you saw what we talked about as a topic um, as re related to our young folks getting to their greatness, right? Um, what were your thoughts on, on the, the panel and, and, and the subject matter there? Um. I thought it was great. I mean, the brothers talk about their own lives and what inspired them. Um, I think it's important for our youth to know that the experiences that they're having are valuable and it's going to help them skill up um, later on in life. Um, and, you know, uh, youth is a rehearsal for manhood and womanhood. You know, you're rehearsing, you're doing exercises, you're practicing um, in order to see what type of personality, what type of character, and what type of person you're going to be. And so hopefully, like Maoli likes to talk about, uh, you, you, you get as many good touches and positive touches you can and in order to build those skills. Mm -hmm. um, our generation, as you know, I, I, you know, and when I compare, you know, we're, we're Generation Xs. But when I look at millennials and um, Generation Z, my son is 23, he's Z, my daughter's 13, she's Z. You know, I, I never feel they're doing enough activities. Uh, and when we were involved in activities, I played in the band. I played um, all of the sports. My neighborhood was the same, you know, as far as, you know, people playing all sports. People were good in all sports. You know, I go anywhere. I, I'm, I'm, I'm the man. 
But in my own city, I'm just regular dude, uh, a good, I'm a baller, but I'm a regular baller. Right. You know, among some greats because it was, it was a culture there. And so, um, you know, the brother, one of the brothers talked about his life uh, growing up in, uh, around criminality, um, mm-hmm. how that impacted him, him, his life and how a good woman um, helped to inspire him to change, you know, how he saw life and his perspective. And um, what he did, those, that life experience was important for him to be able to see and read people. That's what he talked about. Knowing the psychology of folks across the board table has made him, you know, quite successful. Mm-hmm. And so what I would tell youth is all of your experiences are significant and are important. And um, they actually will help you skill up in the future. And so embrace them good, bad, or indifferent, ugly, embrace them and be able to utilize those later. Somehow it's going to sing through and help you get through um, um, a lot of uh, situations and lessons. And as you know, Marty, we use basketball um, as, uh, as, as to, is our Kung Fu, you know, it teaches us so many lessons, you know, if we get knocked down, you get back up, you hustle back down the court, you got to get back up and hustle in life. It's the same thing. You got. I've been divorced a couple times, so I, I understanding getting back up on your feet after you've been, you know, uh, financially obliterated. You know, to a certain extent, to ensure that your children and others are taken care of, and so you sacrifice in a manner and a way to to ensure all of that. Um, but you know, all of these things are I, I, I saw from the panel. I, I, what I took away is making sure that our life experiences um, uh, speak to um, our, our future and present life um, on how we go about doing things and skilling up. So that's what that's what I heard them saying to me. Yeah, yeah, uh, kind of a, across the board. That message was was underlined in everything that, that the the panelists said, um, and, and basically these experiences that you have are, you know, really what you're supposed to have to help you to get to your, whatever that purpose is. Right. We have one panelist talking about purpose being more important than, you know, the, the, the financial gain, That's right. of, you know, and, and um, the purpose happens. And I think we get this as we get older, we start to learn that purpose is far more important than, the, you know, whatever the material thing is you may have wanted, whatever your financial goals are, because as you, as you work through that purpose, and as you start to see that, you start to feel the greatness, mm. you know, you start to feel really great about what you're doing, number one, but then number two, all that other stuff usually follows right behind it. So, yeah, I got that. That was great stuff, man. And Fred, I want to come to you with, um, you know, I know that you, you are in the educational space. You been teaching for a good while. Um, so you've seen some things, right? You've seen some some kids that have not done so well, and you've seen some that have done really well, I'm sure, you know, that, that probably have come back to you at a later date to say, you know, Mr. Parham, thank you, you know, or, or at least to tell you about whatever they got to, right? Um, and, and, and telling you that as a means of telling you thank you, you know what I mean? Might, might not say thank you right out, but that's definitely letting you know. So what have you seen in the youth that you have interacted with in terms of them getting to that greatness? What have you seen as traits? What have you seen as things that they've done? Um, and if you got any examples, cool, but you know, you can tell us about that. Yeah, <clears throat> it's funny. Um, you, you use the word greatness because I was just telling a few of the young people I w- was working with today that uh, I should get some shirts made called Walking in Your Greatness uh, mm-hmm. because that's my mantra, you know, to them both mm-hmm. when they succeed and when they fail. Right. And, you know, I have the, the sincere privilege to work with students who have a lot of means and resources and the college students that I work with. But then I work with the least of these. One of my students is homeless who just got her GED um, and others are in group homes. 
you know, and, and really have homes that, um, you know, are, let's just say, un non-traditional. And so, you know, in that, they suffer a sense of a lack of identity. Um, and so I can see uh, just in the work over the years that, you know, you, you learn to measure success differently when you're working in the lives of human beings. Uh, and I'm sure Jerry would agree that, you know, a failure is not even possible when you're sincerely seeking to inspire a student as an educator. They may not rise to the level with the word you use, Marty, material wealth, but they will be leaders nevertheless, if nothing else but their own home. Mm -hmm. And the stability that they lacked or whatever that family they come from, they can anchor one of their own. And so, you know, just empowering young people in that regard is probably the thing that I see most common is that just young people needing to be empowered, you know, across the board. Because while those who are in college I work with have all the advantages of being in college and, you know, in that piece, um, you know, it's, there's something to be said for someone who has a sense of identity and purpose. Um, and even though you might come from a particular home, it doesn't guarantee you have a strong sense of identity or purpose, mm -hmm. uh, part of a community, in fact. Uh, and that's why, you know, over the years, we brothers, you know, see the same brothers, same faces in different places. Uh, you know, supporting what we love so much. But part of the reason we love it is because we experienced it. And, uh, and so, yeah, I, I appreciate, you know, just being in that position to work with so many different kinds of young people. Sure. And, that, you, you know, you said something there, um, you know, being, being able to do the work and, and having, seeing any sort of success within it, right? Where you see some uh, a person's life that you've affected in a positive way. That, that, I mean, there's no there's no monetary value for it, right? You see that and you're just like, okay, we're, we're moving, we're moving forward, right? We're moving our folks forward. And you, know, you also talked about that failure piece. I think what happens so often, especially with our young folks is, um, a failure occurs, right? And, and I don't even like using the term failure. I'll say a, a non-success occurs, right? Where you, something didn't go their way. And it can be derailing and wind up being the end of whatever that greatness was that they had. Or it can be a learning opportunity and a stepping stone to get them that much closer to their greatness. And the most successful people in whatever they've done have failed probably more than most folks, you know? Because the thing is, usually people fail and that's the end of it. <laughs> you know, you stop trying, right? So I got that message out of, um, out of that on Monday as well. That was something that was said that um, somebody used the analogy of the, of, uh, the uh, seed of the redwood tree, right? The seed of the of redwood, right, in, in California. You can't get 20 people to lock arms around one of the trees they're so big. But, and, and they you know, go all the way up into the sky high. But that tree came from a seed this big, right? So that seed had to succeed and succeed and work and work and work, you know, go through different kinds of um, environmental stuff, you name it. They've had to survive to get to that big, big, big tree that they become. That's no different than us. You know, we have to work and work through all the different challenges that we have in life to get to the greatness that, that we want to get to. Um, but I love the idea of purpose behind it, man. So let, let's let's talk about that a little bit further. Um, you know, we're always encouraging our young folks to what whatever your dream is. I don't care what it is. You want to be an astronaut, go. You know, do whatever you got to do to do that. What do you think is the, and I'll start with you, Fred, what do you think is the most important piece for people to start with in terms of getting into their greatness? Um, I think a sense of belonging and self-worth uh, and, and probably the same, that's the same thing. 
Mm -hmm. um, but it's so important uh, to live in a life where you create value. Right, and, and that's not, again, limited to any material thing. So I think the most important thing is just a sense of self-worth and belonging uh, because life, as we all know, is tough. So that, that molds you, and it, but there are more hands than yours on the molding, mm -hmm. that community in which you're, you're molded and shaped. Uh, those examples that Jared mentioned in the Morehouse brother. Uh, who came all the way from Morehouse to Racine. Uh, but that was probably on invitation from some of his community leaders, you know, whether school officials or, or neighborhood people. So I think that, that the molding and the sense of belonging happen when, when we can provide, you know, texture and identity to our kids, you know, uh, mm. to their lives. So I think that's the most important trait of uh, living a purpose-filled life. That's good stuff. That's good stuff. What about you, Fred? Uh, excuse me, Jared? Yeah, I, you know, to dovetail a lot what, what we've been talking about, purpose and direction. The brother talked about purpose and you brought it back up, uh, Marty. Um, what's, the pur what's your purpose? And so one of the things our students, our, our youth have to know is, what, answer that question. What yeah. is your purpose? Why do you think you were you are here? You know, um, and so and and know that put some folks around you that's going to help you. Uh, Fred and I talked about this a couple of weeks back. You know, our friendship circle uh, circle is is a serious circle. Mm -hmm. You know, um, we inspire each other to um, go further. Our peer pressure is, you know, um, Fred, finish your PhD. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and that's what that brother is doing. Right. You, know, you know, another brother told me that, you know, almost 10, 10 years ago, you know, hey, man, you need to, you know, finish that, you know, um, uh -huh. you know, we got attorneys around us, you know, my only's fighting civil rights cases. He's the attorney we would want to be if we were attorneys, right. you know, and that's inspirational. You know, um, one of my other closest friends, everybody knows, Dr. Gary White, his inspiration to in the field of social work and how many lives he's saved, Black family lives he has saved. These are priesthoods. And in my, month, in my priesthood of my career, I also am a part of a brotherhood that does certain things for their community, for their people. Sure. And so I'm telling these youth, what's your purpose? And whatever you think that is, now I need you to get disciplined about it. Mm -hmm. You know, I need you to focus on it. I need you to um, work on it. I, in, in, in my classes, I talk about what's called, um, and people have heard of it, the 10,000 hour rule. But I take it to 50,000 hours, five times 10,000. Mm -hmm. Meaning you got to have something in five different areas. Whatever it is that you think your purpose as far as career is concerned, you should be working on those hours in that. You should be working on something physical in your life because you should be moving in energy. Is that basketball? Play basketball. If it's dancing, dance. But you need to be doing something physical. Technology. We're in the age, we're in the digital age. We're, we're now surfacing on web 3.0. What is your proficiency in something te technological? Number four, art. What art form are you doing? You know, are you painting? Are you doing poetry? You need something that allows your right brain to express itself in, in a particular way, which helps to inspire you in ways that you don't even know about yourself. And lastly, of course, but not least, is spirit. What are you doing to work on yourself spiritually? We all need a spiritual center. But, so what is that? You know, are you Muslim? Are you Christian? Are you, um, do you practice African spiritual, spirit, spirituality? Do you practice um, um, Buddhism, Hinduism? You know, what is it? And how well are you capturing and understanding the depths of those, um, those spiritual systems? So five times 10,000, 50,000 hours, you should never be bored. A child saying I'm bored 
means that they're boring because you don't have time because you're rehearsing for manhood, you're rehearsing for womanhood. So you don't have time, you're supposed to be skilling up. You know, you're supposed to be working on yourself and we're constantly working on ourselves and we're constantly passing different stages. We are now working on becoming the best elders for our community. We're not there yet, but- <laughs> watch, watch your mouth, man. <laughs> we're not there, we, we're long from there, you know? <laughs> We're spry at our age, where at this age, when we was young, you kind of look a little bit more broke down. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that that's not what Generation X looks like. Generation X looks totally different. So we're bringing a whole new thing on what eldership will look like. And so, and how we will inspire the next generation. So that's 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 my piece. That, that's good stuff, man. That's, that is really good stuff. And, and uh, you know, it's funny, you just mentioned just on my mind right now, you just mentioned, you know, us working on elders. I've had so many young folks lately that, you know, I look in my mind, I'm like, well, we're not that far apart in age, you know, in my mind. Exactly. And they, they're like, hey, unk. Exactly. <laughs> if I get unked one more time, boy. <laughs> hey, hey, Marty, I what about a few years ago, you know, they was on the basketball court, they was like, they would say, Hey, old school, pass me. Yeah. The oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And so I couldn't conceive of this. Yeah. They call it real old school. school. Right, right. I'm, I'm taking all y'all to the hoop. What you talking about? Exactly, exactly. I got mad. I, I, I get old school, he can shoot, you know. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I had that one so many times. But uh, you know, one of the questions that was <clears throat> asked on on Monday that I thought was pretty interesting because I thought that I really knew the answer and I knew how it would be answered, but it, it went a different direction, um, was um, how, do we, how do we help to inspire our younger folks to find their purpose to get to their greatness, right? Um, and, and, I have an idea about that, but I want to hear you all. What do you all think is the kind of that, that bridge, if you will, to help um, our, our young folks to see that there is a possibility of achieving whatever that is and, and at a very high level? What do you think, Fred? Yeah, I think uh, <laughs> it's having, you know, I have five kids, three adults and two, one in high school, freshman year and one in the eighth grade. And, uh, and, and I've taught for 20 years. And I think, you know, one, if, if you want to see, see young people be successful, you have to inspire them. You have to live an inspired life um, as a parent, as a, as a, you know, teacher or, or whatever. So to inspire someone, you have to live an inspired life. Uh, and so that means whatever you're passionate about, it has to exude from your, your, your life, meaning it becomes a part of your teaching conversation and instruction. It becomes part of the examples you use to model what concepts you're talking about in class, like resilience. You know, it's a whole curriculum now called social and emotional learning. And it's got all these, these words that grandmama used to do uh and naturally resilience and you know if you get knocked down get back up and you know critical thinking and decision making well uh from the very core of it it's just being a example of how to live uh for you know not just your own kids but other kids you know i've had kids come to me and say you know man i'm not in your class but I want to be in your class mm. because your students talk about you to us and they make us want to be in your class, mm. you know, when I'm teaching high school and, and, but it ain't about the lesson, you know, or me being ex excellent in math and social science. It's about the inspired life and, and which comes out mm. in the conversation. So to me, that's the sure way, to inspire someone is to give them a good example and model that, and more importantly, that is tangible and it can be an inner exchange 
and not somebody on the television or on on a, you know video screen where it's just a one way kind of thing. Sure. Yeah. That's 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 awesome and, and a great um, point. I think one of the things that um, we we know right. And we have a great example with Black Men Lab, right? That that space exactly that. You know, we have young folks that, that thirst to come in there with, with regularity um, because they're getting fed, right? They get in right, well, they're getting fed both, both, you know, in reality with food, but then also mental food as well. Um, and I think that that's a piece that there can't be enough of it. You know, again, yeah. like, like Jared was saying earlier, um, you know, Molly always talks about touches. He and I are always, we're always talking about well, behind the scenes, how can we touch, get, make sure that people are getting, you know, getting touched. And um, I, look at that, I just talked about Yeah, if I could <laughs> a quote that one of my mentor teachers gave me 20 years ago, Baba Hannibal I Freak from Chicago, where you yeah, yeah, from, yeah. Um, uh, uh, just an educator supreme, just preeminent. But he said, you know, a candle, loses nothing of its light by lighting another candle, mm -hmm. right? And so by living an inspired life, one can then inspire another life mm -hmm. and not lose anything. Yeah. So my large brother asked me the other day and I shut up, he said, man, how in the hell do you do what you do, right? This is my Masonic large brother. Mm -hmm. So he knows me in that, but he also, so I said, brother, it, it's just one thing. You know what I'm saying? What you see as a whole lot of things is just one thing, right. you know, and I just carve my day up, you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. take my 24 hours and use them evenly, or I, I strive to do that. Right. So, you know, a candle. That's, That's awesome stuff right there. I'm, I'm From Maui. <laughs> hey, brother. Welcome. We just talked you up. I just talked you up, man. I didn't know you were going to get on here. Oh uh, man, I had to, man. I was watching on Facebook. I was like, these brothers are going to town. <laughs> <laughs> For real. This is it, man. This is it. I um I'm trying to catch up on my black August fast days. I had missed some days. So I'm I, that's why you see me gobbling down this stuff because I'm still keeping my fast going until I complete my uh my black August days. But brothers, um loving this, man. Loving this critical and important in terms of how, how we bring this greatness forward. So I just wanted to just lean in and just uh, express that gratitude. Man, thanks for jumping on, man. And, man, right. and the disciplined soldier that you are, you know, uh, living that inspired life right now. So appreciate you jumping in here, man. Having been a dad, you know, and you're a part-time teacher, <laughs> whether you know hey. it or not. <laughs> hey, man. Every day is a lesson. There you for, go. For, for me and for others, depending on what you know, what I teach, you know, or how I live it. So I'm with y'all. I'm with y'all 100 on that. Yes, sir. Hey, hey, Jared. What about you, man? On that same kind of question that I just asked Fred. Did. You know, Fred but, said that key line of uh, living an inspired life. You know, um, and Maoli always like to talk about touch. You know, we have we have to put our kids in uh, spaces for opportunity, mm -hmm. and they have to be in spaces for exposure. Now we naturally do that in Black Man Lab because we all naturally done that individually, and mm -hmm. we just came together as a brotherhood and began to do it together to the tune that I can I get to relax a little bit because you know. I'm, I don't have to be Jordan on the court doing all the scoring. I can, you know, we can pass a little bit. If I can get my only to pass once in a while, you know, my only to <laughs> hold the ball. <laughs> but, um, but I, the, the, seriously, it's those opportunities and exposure, you yes. know. But there's one key ingredient that we can't teach. And so somehow they have, we have to try to do things to help inspire them. And, and that is self-motivation. You know, um, we we are we have a poverty of self motivation, uh, and there's a poverty of internal um, internal motivation. 
And so we have to provide them with exposure and opportunities in order to turn on that thing that's going to inspire them. You know, sure. um, I've, I've inspired a lot of my students in some of the greatest ways, but two of the, two of the hardest people, people for me to inspire and, and give all this great knowledge to is my own children. Sure. You know, they, 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 that's, they, the, that's the essence of Black Man Life. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, I, 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 I wait for these opportunities to have drop sessions, but it's not until they feel or go through something that they're like, oh, okay, now I understand yeah. what you were saying. Yeah. And now I want to hear more from you about it. But you know, so I have to be ready when they pass the ball because, you know, um, that's the only time they're going to give me the assist to allow me to score, which is meaning allow me to impart um, um, some wisdom with them sure. and then put other people around them, you know, for, for the wisdom as well. Right. There's nothing more, you know, I may have said this to you before, Riley, one time my oldest daughter, um, this is right when she was getting ready to graduate um, college. And uh, we were on the phone late night and she she was talking about whatever the subject matter was. I don't remember what it was, but she said, Dad, remember when you told me? And then just everything stopped, you know, because it was like, oh my God, you actually listened to something and you held it. You know what I mean? It meant something to you and you held it. And that's what we, you know, we live for because so often, you know, I think it's, I can speak for the brothers here. We're sharing with other, you know, young folks that are that are sucking up whatever information we may have to give, and yet it's hard as heck at home, you know, um, for, with your own. We always experience. I don't and, know what. And let me add something there, Marty. You know, uh, my son, uh, one of his high school girlfriends, um, he was talking to her mother um, mm -hmm. about some things, and they were just talking. And what she says to him after they were talking for a while, she said, oh, my God, Tariq, who's my son, um, are you conscious? She couldn't believe that she was talking to someone who had such depth in, mm -hmm. you know, social consciousness and history. Sure. And so she was like, where did this come from? And she was, he was just like, well, my dad, I mean, I've been living this my entire life. But since he never really sp speaks a lot. Right. You know, you would know that he is second generation conscious. So yeah. they behave differently from us. Yeah. As yeah. far as their consciousness, because they, 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 they're natives to consciousness where we are immigrants mm -hmm. um, to, to consciousness. You know, we mm -hmm. had to sail to this land and get light and they came out the womb, you know, with light. Mm -hmm. And so um, and so that that. That little story that just reminded me of that. That's yeah, right. yeah. I mean, there's so many of those. I'm sure we could all share those. Um, you know, one of the things that you you guys were talking about there was, um, you know, we, we, we talked about purpose. We talked about you know pushing towards whatever that greatness looks like and how to get there, being in the right spaces and all those things. Um, I think that, and this is a good example. I'm gonna pull Mountain again to talk about. It. Um, from our observations of the We Need You project, right? We just dropped the album um, and the music that came from this project is amazing. And I've been, I've been vetting it with all, you know, young folks that I know. And then they're like, whoa, this is fire, this is fire. You know, as a, you know, they say, it's fire, it's fire. And um, <laughs> so, and, and, and it is to me too, you know, we listen to it, I'm like, damn, this is really good, good product. But the funny part of it is on the front end of, of you know, Miley's vision of the, of the project, and then as we put it all together, on the front end of it, you wouldn't have known that those kids had that kind of talent. You know, you wouldn't have known that they would tap in, not just in terms of their skill sets or whatever that talent was, whether it was spoken word, rap, singing, whatever, painting, you wouldn't, have, you, that, that's one thing. But the piece of them being able to read the, actually read the book, digest it, and then put out product around it, whatever that product was, 
that was what was amazing to me. And that speaks to what I think we have to work so hard at is getting them, all of our young folks, um, we use the, the, you know, we need you project, which was around music. Um, but there's got to be other tools out there. So Molly, jump in there. I'm, 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 I'm excited. That's why I'm talking so much about it because it was, I listened to the whole thing last night while I was working. Yeah, man. I, I just listened to it for the third time in a row. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think the finding these young they're, they're finding the space they're comfortable in. You know, it's like a player on the court. There's certain times if if I was playing point guard and I gave the big man the ball at the free throw line on a fast break, my coach would go crazy. Like, what are you doing? Obviously now um, you got big players that can, can handle the ball as well as many guards. But back in the day, it was like you keep that ball until you deliver it on the block where they can finish, right? And so I think it's about – where are those places that they feel comfortable operating in, scoring in? And, and, and I think that the more we can find their space and then bring what we have into their space and let them do what they, they will with it, the better. Um, what I'm excited about, about the project, is the possibility of them tapping other young people's lives mm -hmm. through that music a kid that may never pick the book up. And that was the whole objective was, you know, how do we, how do we promulgate this consciousness? And one of the greatest critiques that we hear in our community is that our young people are running, running crazy and doing stuff because of the music. Well, hell, let's give them something else to create. And they have done that. And so now, I hope those same people who are like, you know, it's the music, they buy the music, they promote the music, they stream the music, they sit down with their, um, you know, with their young people in their lives and say, hey, man, let's listen to this album together. Tell me what you think and, and find where they may have information. Because when you hear Kwame Ture in one of the songs, the adult may know. And the young person, well, who is Kwame Ture? Then it's an opportunity for a conversation. So um, I'm just excited about those possibilities and how we really pump and promote this to bring out that greatness in all of the young people. There is not, and I'll be quiet after this, there isn't a, an educator that's worth a dime that could tell you that a person is able to achieve at a high level if they don't have some level of self-knowledge and some level of, of clarity around cultural clarity. And there's no way you can be of service to us if you're culturally confused. There's no way. You can be incredible, but you won't be able to serve us. You might, you might help others. So... Mm. Um, and, and I did want to share, um, Marty, just as an aside, that um, Jared is a real gunner. He, he does not pass. <laughs> so, I, I'm a true point guard. I deliver at all times. This dude. I'm a I, true, honestly, I'm a I've true, never. Not the Navy. Not the Navy. Hey, term. hey Jared, I'm a, I'm, just, I'm a true too. I'm hey, never, Jared, I would just say I'm a man. You're a man after my heart, bro. That's all I can tell you. It's just. It's a, it's a catch, shoot, or catch and put your head down and go to the rack. <laughs> hey, Molly, who was the leading scorer when we played Kobe and Sahari in them? Oh, yeah, of course, Jerry. He, and, he, and, my, he, and Molly was the leading assist man. Hey, so, hey, it's all good. That's how we work together. Hey, look. look. Hey. My, Molly always knew where to get me the ball, which was never me going to the basket. I was never my thing. Always a shooter. He'd be, he would look me off. You know, I'd be cutting to the basket. He'd like, <laughs> look me uh, off. Just keep, I just tell him, keep coming through. Come through. Yeah, come through. Come through. Get out there to that three. <laughs> but came to appreciate that because he's absolutely right. I don't know what it was. It wasn't my thing. So, uh, hey, so anyway, brothers, man, we 
Did, uh, Fred, were you going to say something before you had your hand? Yeah, right? no, I was about to try to tie a knot, man, for the listeners and viewers. Uh -huh. uh, the picture behind you was the first day of school, at, um, and I hope the viewers can see it. But it was the first day of school at a high school here in Atlanta, Carver High School. And so tying the knot to Miley's point about, you know, making that wave roll in the ocean of our community, like the young people that were inspired to create the album, now we're tying that together by bringing the program to Carver High School. Because yeah, Miley, we're mining for diamonds right there at Carver. And so, yeah, we rolling the thing out. And uh, I'm certain that the mentorship between those peer groups mm. uh, will produce something we didn't even anticipate. And to me, as an educator, that's the fun part, you know, is seeing the product because we labor, us educators, uh, we labor in the field where we're not in the lives of other people. And we're not always privy to how the story ends. Mm. So, but it always ends and, you know, or it always, when it comes back, it's like, dang, boy, you a preacher now? <laughs> you would have never thought you would. You stayed <laughs> in detention. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. It, you know, I think that what I've come to realize and as we talk about uh, getting to their greatness, our, our young folks getting to their greatness, what I've come to realize is that there is nothing that they can't do if they put their minds to it. Um, there's the possibilities are endless. And I also think that every, everybody, you know, has a divine purpose. And behind that, that means the, whatever the work is that you're supposed to do, like, like Miley, he's, you know, I've known this cat for the vast majority of his life. He's doing what he's supposed to do. I could have told you that back then when we were, you know, 12, 13 years old. I could tell you that that's what he's doing is what he's supposed to do. That was his divine purpose. And he's living it, right? And there's so many, you guys as educators, same thing. It's clear to me that this is what you all are supposed to do. Um, but I think what happens with our young folk is that there's, there's so much static in between their, their divine purpose and, and their lives, within their lives, that gets in the way of them seeing, you know, what am I supposed to, what am I really good at? You know, and we're like with, with the We Need You project, we've seen so much come out of it, not just the music, but people being, becoming, you know, somewhat activists or getting into doing, you know, digital work, whatever it is, and really being like, yeah, this is my thing. We had one, one guy, um, who just now is just taking off in terms of doing anything as it relates to marketing and, and stuff like that, because he's found his, you know, his purpose and what he really wants to do. And I imagine you look up 10 years from now and he's going to be super successful at it, you know? So um, we just have to provide those spaces. We have to provide those spaces for them to see that. And uh, that's why I'm excited about us doing this thing at Carver. Um, and then hopefully with doing it there, we can expand elsewhere as well. Yeah. And like you said, what, what was that? The candle, you know, a candle lighting another candle. Don't lose any flame. No. So, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. Baba Hannibal, I free. Yes, All sir. Right. Hey, and he, and he also said, which we have up in our office, don't show me your theory, show me your work. Yep. Mm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm. And, that, and that's the other piece behind it, too. The kids, yeah, they have to know. Do the, just got, do the work. Yeah. Do the work. Well, that's all it was. <laughs> just, do, do the work. And you do the work. And that's what's so funny. If you really just do the work, especially at a young age, you do the work. Oh, man. Man, you just, just take off, you know. And uh, got, all, got all the energy, bro. Us, us unks, on the other hand, you know, we do the work. And we might get a little more now. You know? So we had to face ourselves. But uh, brothers, man, we this has been amazing. I'm so glad that we were able to do this tonight. Molly, so glad that you could jump on. Um, but we're going to end. We're, we're up against the clock. But before we end, do the same thing we always do, which is talk about habits, rituals, and disciplines. And those things that you all are doing on a daily basis to keep you moving forward, keep you getting to your greatness. So um, brother Jared, I'm going to start with you. 
your habits, rituals, and disciplines? First thing I do is I get up, um, I drink uh, uh, 32 ounces of water, hmm. and then I do my prayers, libation, and meditation. And, um, and then from there, I uh, uh, try to get some exercise in. Um, first thing in the morning, I go out and uh, get my run and walk on and um, then come back, get dressed and get ready for my day. Um, and uh, sometimes I get up and I also, uh, you, I add by reading some things. I, I read all the time, but you know, uh, if I can do a nice early morning read, that would be great. But while I'm walking and running, I'm listening to lectures. You know, so I'm, I'm constantly feeding myself. Um, and so um, constantly being fed information and knowledge. And so it's, it's a constant. So, so now what, what, what typically are you listening to? What kind of lectures? Um, different things right now because I'm focused on my dissertation. So I'm dealing with the African Union. I'm dealing with Pan-Africanism. I'm dealing with um, um, uh, uh, racism in the international system. You know, I'm dealing with neoliberalism. Uh, I, I'm dealing with um, um, theoretical framework. So I'm listening to various and different scholars and workshops and conferences that cover these various topics. Gotcha. Good and of stuff. course, always my favorite is Dr. John Henry Clark. You know, he Same. was one of, he was, J, Dr. J was my first inspiration since, since exactly. he that. And then John Henry Clark was my second. So one physically, and one took me intellectually. Sure. Let's do. You see what Fred's holding up there? Yeah, yeah. Um, notes from uh, African World Revolution by Dr. John McClark. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, oh I had the opportunity to uh, listen and live his lectures and sit at the feet and talk to him for a while. So. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, it made the reading list. That's great stuff. Um, you know, you, you said, you, you said, uh, you do that morning workout, man. That is so, I got, I got so used to it that, um, I came to realize that that's, that morning workout is a uh, energy boost for your day, you know? Sure. And, um, the way that I came to realize it was that I just recently moved this past weekend <clears throat> and up to when we moved. I was packing the stuff every day, getting the house ready to move. So I wasn't getting my morning workout. So you can imagine doing all that heavy lifting, but then not getting my morning workout. At the end of the day, I was sacked, you know, versus when I knew I had my morning, my morning workout. And I had energy all the way through the day into the evening. So that's great stuff. Can't wait to get back at it and uh, get, get back at it so I can pop my energy pills. <laughs> what about you, Fred? Habits, rituals, and disciplines? Man, I'll be quick, man. You know, uh, first thing, if I, my consciousness is, you know, I'm thankful for, you know, everything. And, and in that Thanksgiving, I'm then setting my vision for what my day is uh, going to be like, what victories, um, that I must have so that my day can be productive. And once my feet hit the floor, you know, it's just about routine until I get to the altar. And, you know, you know, the evolution of my prayers, man, is, is uh, has been so interesting because Reverend Rice planted this seed about, you know, we pray to our, you know, divine source, but then, you know, how do, what is, what does God sound like, right? And so, you know, that seed sprouted to me just my prayers evolving to now just about creativity. So then I'm off for the day and the rest of the day, you know, it's just focusing on the meditation of, uh, you know, daily life. You know, mm -hmm. in, in the Buddhist practice, we talk about our faith equaling daily life and that all of our actions, you know, thoughts and words uh, demonstrate our faith in the real world. Mm -hmm. uh, to inspire those around us and be inspired mm -hmm. by those who, who are doing the same, lighting another candle. True. So we can see each other, you know, in dark spaces, whether the light is on or not on. 
and so, and that was just by voice. So rituals, habits, you know, just what they call the, uh, the secret used to be in the power of envisioning mm-hmm. uh, things and then the power of prayer and practice, you know, together. So every day yeah. ritualistic, even on Sunday. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Because um, that, that, that being thankful every morning and grateful, we'll start your day with that and then trying to figure out a way to remain in that space throughout the day. Um, even when you have those rough moments, you know, whatever it is, somebody got on your nerves, something, you, heck, you bang your knee, whatever. Um, finding that grateful space always keeps you moving forward and allows you yes. to let it go. You know, so perfect, perfect opportunity to practice. You should thank that person. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> For making you practice. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Hey, Molly, since we got you, you share your habits, rituals, and disciplines. Oh, man. Everything that, um, I mean, I think it's repetitive. Get up. Um, I'm reading now. Um, I start out by writing out my day. Um, so I write out my whole day. Sometimes I put at what time I'm doing things, but I write it right out the whole day. And then um, I meditate. Um, then I stretch and then I hit that treadmill and try to get my miles in. But now I've um, been more intentional about coming back before I walk out the door is hitting that mat and praying and um, pouring my libations. I've been pouring libations kind of as I go out the door, but now I'm trying to sit on that mat and just pray a little bit and read some of the um, some of the scriptures, the scriptures of our traditions, and I'll read that, and then I'm then I'm gone. So I think um, that's it. That's it. Try to kiss Jane every morning before I roll out, and um, man, I just try to move in that gratitude try to move in that gratitude so um i'm grateful for you brothers all of you brothers are very special to me and have have played a role in my son's life and i think as as we grow older you you know you look for and you hope for you pray that whatever you've done in another um young man's life or a child's life you you pray that there'll be an adult that Mm -hmm. will reciprocate in some way for your child who's going you know you just you know you believe in the universe that the that there will be someone that'll step into your child's life provide them what they need when they need it the way dr robinson did for me or conrad worrell or baba hannibal our freak the way mama and jerry did um you know this that's it that's it so um Great, great session tonight, brothers. I feel uh, my feel first like- time out. <laughs> first time out. Hey, well, listen, man, we're over the over the time already, man. I told you, I told y'all, brothers, at the beginning, this is gonna go quick. Um, especially knowing you all and how strong you are, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate y'all coming on tonight um, to keep the keep keeping uh, lab results rolling because it's about. The results is about what got you to where you're at, man. So appreciate that. And we're gonna close out like we always do, y'all. If y'all can lock in with me. And just repeat after me. I'm a link in this chain. I'm a link, link in this chain. chain. And it won't break here. And, and it, it won't break, break here. here. I'm a link in this chain. I'm, I'm a link, link in this chain. chain. And it won't break here. And, and it, it won't, won't break, break here. here. We are links in this chain. We are links in this chain. And we won't break here. And, and we, we won't break here. Break here. I share. Say, say yo, brothers. Thank y'all, man. Always good, brothers. Um, also, real quick, uh, links to the music on all streaming platforms um, for, for the uh, We Need You project. So if you're listening in tonight, Go to any of your platforms and look up Black Man Lab. We need you. And all of the all of our music is there. So I uh, hope you take a listen to it and give us some feedback if you do. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. All right. Love y'all, man. Talk to you. Love you, brothers. All right, brother.